Welcome to Africa Design, the show that takes African design to the world. Brought to you by Nairobi Design Week. I'm Adrian Jankowiak. On this episode, we're speaking with Esther Kute. Esther is the former head of design at Bata Kenya. She's the youngest, the first female, and the first African to hold the position within the company. In this conversation, we discuss her first break into the industry, working with men, footwear design, arguing with the boss's boss, negotiating salaries, launching shoes in Milan, mentorship, and much more. Be sure to visit NairobiDesignWeek.com and subscribe to our channel for more African design. And leave a review or comment to let us know what you thought. Thank you. Stay safe. Esther, thank you for joining us. And it's a real, real pleasure to have your time here. I know you're, you've had a very busy decade or so. Mm-hmm. Um, so and, and you're someone in the Kenyan design industry who's really made it through, you could say, uh, an entire career path. So it's really interesting to be able to have this conversation with you. So it'd be great to just find out how, how did you get into design in the first place? Okay, thank you, Adrian, for having me. Uh, well, uh, I studied design in the uh, University of Nairobi in my undergrad. Yes, and to be honest, I didn't like it because mm-hmm. I wanted to do architecture. Mm. So I was called to university and I kept hoping when they say design, they mean architecture. So for a long time, uh, for the first year, second year, I was not uh, the best of students, of design students. <laughs> I'd miss classes, you know, I'd be late or, you know, stuff like that. Then um, in the third year of our, uh, um, actually in the second year, towards the end of the second year in the university, I was uh, drafted into a program uh, with an NGO called Terra Nova by my lecturer, one of my lecturers. And uh, I remember telling her, I'm busy. And she's like, doing what? (laughs) You have to get this done. So yeah, it was a collaboration between this uh, Italian organization, Terra Nova, uh, the University of Nairobi mm-hmm. and uh, the Juakali industry in Kenya. So basically the informal sector. Mm-hmm. And what would happen is uh, the students at the University of Nairobi, design students, us, would be partnered with the uh, Juakali artisans. So for me, for example, in the first year, I was partnered with the uh, tailors, yes, based in uh, uh, Kangari and uh, Kikuyu. Mm-hmm. Yes, so I would go there and uh, the job was for us to come into their business and uh, show them how to use the design process, yes, to make products. So you're no longer just, uh, I don't know, patching up clothes or Mm -hmm. sewing clothes. You're like, okay, so who is my customer? Why am I making these clothes for them? You know, Mm -hmm. my target market, stuff like that. You know, how do I choose the colors to complement each other? Yeah. So... I have to say, I always say that's the time I fell in love with design because, <laughs> and specifically textile design, because then I ended up majoring in textile and fashion design. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because Terra Nova was a very intensive project. We would go to the field, and at the end of it, we did it two years, and at the end of it, we would uh, have a, uh, an exhibition so wow. where people would come and buy your product. And you know, there's this thing, uh, I always say designers are gods, small gods, <laughs> because then you you had this idea in your mind, you've worked with this artisan, and uh, you make a product that is beautiful, and someone comes and they buy and they tell you, this is so beautiful. Mm. And you know, we were taught uh, something like costing, for example, how to make your product and cost it so that you sell it without making a loss, but not overpricing it. And it was so funny, when you we went to the market, uh, People would come by my products with the artisan and they'd be like, but this is so cheap. I think you should make it more expensive. (laughs) And I'm like, what? You know, Mm -hmm. so it was really nice. I think that woke me up to design. And since then, I've always been passionate about design. Uh, Yeah. So that's how I started, I would say. Okay. Okay. So you started with fashion and textiles instead of architecture. And then it kind of, it let you naturally find your path as well. Yeah, it's interesting because now uh, in our fourth year of studies, we do our final year project. Uh, So you're supposed to do a research paper in the first uh, semester where you identify a topic and then you research about it, go to the field and do a paper, you write a thesis about it. Then in the second semester, you do a practical based on the thesis that you Mm -hmm. did. So for me, I decided I did a paper on uh, recycling and reusing of textile waste Mm. because it was so interesting. 
I noticed people would throw away shoes. Can you imagine you're walking and you just find old shoes thrown into the dustbin, uh, bags thrown into the dustbin, you know, stuff like that. So I was wondering, how then can we utilize these products and make a design business out of it? So I ended up making a fashion collection for mm -hmm. women, uh, <laughs> and it was inclusive of uh, bags, shoes, uh, wallets, you know, things like that. And I was using recycled materials that are textile waste. Yes. Mm. So I would get like an old jacket, for mm -hmm. example, tear it up, cut it up into a bag. And uh, I was also using old, uh, okay, not really old, but uh, the indigenous practices that were used by textile designers, mm. not designers, but textile practices in Africa. So I would get, let's say, I would weave, uh, I would get the old leather jackets, weave them, uh -huh. and then stitch them into something, or kilt. I would get uh, an old sweater, and then remove the threads, and then knit it back, or crochet back, uh -huh. into a scarf, you know? Nice. Yeah, so it was a very cool project. And one of the things that I did was also make shoes. So of course, then I was not a, sh a shoe designer. <laughs> but then, again, with the old leather jackets, and... Uh, old sweaters. I, I designed a collection. I got a, a, an artisan from uh, Kibira who had, had actually worked with in on uh, the Terranova project. Yes. So they made for me a shoe collection. Mm -hmm. So the funny thing is, uh, during the exhibition, we call it a pin-up because that's when they, uh, it's, a, it's an examination, basically. Mm -hmm. You're pinning uh, up your work. Exactly. We pin yeah. up our work. So you come into, it's like an exhibition. You'd walk in and you'd find zero dots on my products. And <laughs> you know when you go to a, an auction or a sale and then th they put a red dot to show you something has been sold? That was my pinup. <laughs> <laughs> People had bought my bags, my wallets, my shoes, you know. Yeah, so it was so Everything. crazy. Exactly, yeah. So that really made me realize, oh, okay, so I can actually do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So have you seen on the, you know, the used clothing is a big, big issue in Kenya. Mm -hmm. um, coming from abroad and obviously as well preventing local manufacturing to get up to its uh, potential mm -hmm. have you seen any other projects since your graduation maybe mm -hmm. from students or any others using uh, waste textiles oh mm -hmm. uh, wow well, maybe not waste textile as such but uh, maybe i can move back into my previous area mm -hmm. of uh, design uh, as a footwear designer Yes, um, there's the project where uh, this organization uh, took used flip-flops, pata-pata, basically, mm -hmm. and uh, cut them up and made a boat out of it. You saw this? The... Flip-floppy. Yes, it's yes. called flip-floppy. Flip-floppy, yeah. And I, I mean, I was working for butter. They were actually using part of a waste as butter, sure. you know, and it was so impressive to me that they actually made an actual boat out of this. Mm -hmm. And it looked really beautiful. Another project I noticed, it was done uh, several years ago. Uh, I cannot remember who did it now, but I think uh, the National Museum was involved. And they again used recycled uh, waste from flip flops mm. and they made uh, lion uh, sculptures. Ocean Soul, right? Ocean Soul, yes. yeah. It must have been Ocean Soul, yeah. yes. So they made uh, lion uh, uh, sculptures and mm -hmm. placed them all over the city. So you'd be walking and you're like, oh wow, this is so pretty. What is this? Yes. So uh, that was very cool, actually. Those are those are beautiful. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, those two good. projects are flip floppy is great because it's really a statement. Yes. You know. Yeah. Um, was there any way for someone like Butter to get involved in in those projects with offcuts or not? Uh, yes. In fact, Butter. A lot of people will not know this because uh, Butter, of course, keeps a lot of uh, the business uh, side. I think quiet. You know. Mm -hmm. um, but Butter recycles a lot of things. Yes. Uh, in terms of manufacturing, a lot of the materials that we would use, we mm -hmm. would recycle and reuse. So you'd find even flip flops. Sometimes we'd get old flip flops brought back to us, and we would cut them up and uh, crush into granules, and then reuse them in the products that we make. Yeah. So that is very good for the environment. And one of the projects I was working in uh, towards tw uh, mid 2018 to 2019 at Bata, uh, the global organization uh, has this uh, strategy to increase uh, sustainability by about, I think, 10% mm. by 2020. Mm -hmm. So what happened is we, they formed a committee and uh, the, the idea was every country was to come up with projects that increase sustainability, whether it's using recycling, whether it's in improving lives, you know, whether it's coming up with an innovation product, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was heading the 
well, I was heading the creation of these projects in Kenya, and I'm happy to say by the time I was leaving Bata, I had actually, we had actually implemented five projects. So it was the highest in Africa and the second highest projects uh, implemented in Bata Global. Well done. Yeah. So was the uh, crumbed up rubber one of those projects? Uh, well, since we were to in, in, uh, create new projects, mm. yes. Oh, that was already happening. Exactly. So, so where this does this happening. the recycled rubber, does it go back into soles? Yes, into soles, into gumboots, into flip-flops, whichever it is. Yes, mm -hmm. so you'll find a lot of reused and recycled material in the product. Okay. Yes. Can you tell us about any of the other projects you had? Um, well, uh, while at Bata, I worked on... Uh, there's actually a number of projects I did that I really love. Well, the uh, sustainability ones. Let's start. From oh, with the um, Let's start with those. Am yeah. I able to talk about them now? Let me see. <laughs> I don't want to get you in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me think about it. So, how did you how did you start at Bata? What was your way in there? After? Uh, yes. So, um, uh, you remember in my final year project, I had done shoes, and of course, guys are like, whoa with shoes and butter yeah and uh, i've always wanted to work for butter that's the thing even when i was young my dad butter is synonymous with kenya anyone who's a kenyan has grown up with butter you know we mm -hmm. and uh, we've grown up in goma safari pata pata you know mm -hmm. you go to school toughies you know so my dad had this thing where if you go to the doctor and you're feeling a little you know down he takes you to a butter shop yeah, to get your shoes, and then you're happy. You're happy now. Nice. Yeah, and I'd always, it's so funny. I'd always be like, oh, so what if we do this? I'd always ask the shop guys, what if we change it like this? What if we do it like this? You know. But I was a child then, <laughs> so <laughs> over time, I always thought I always want to work with butter. And even my friends told me, you're the only person we've ever heard who says they want to work with butter. Everyone thinks butter is a global company. It doesn't have, uh, let's say. Uh, an office in Kenya, really. Everyone used to think Bata is either owned by the government or, mm -hmm. yes. Ah, so um, when I did my project, uh, Bata advertised for designers. And uh, at that time, a classmate of mine um, was working there. For me, one, after I'd left university, I'd gone to work at a fashion uh, brand. Yes, so for about a year. Mm -hmm. Yes, so he said, okay, uh, I think you should come interview. I was like, okay. So I went with my portfolio. I think my portfolio, so big, like I'd carry practical, you know, three meter fabric that you screen printed. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so I would always go with a taxi and, you know, bags and bags fulls of uh, prototypes and mm -hmm. things like that. Good. Yes, so I did an interview with the HR manager. It was fantastic, you know, and then they just went quiet. So I thought, oh, well, that is sad. It never went through. Yeah, so I went back to work. I started doing my master's at the University of Nairobi. So one day I get a call. I was in a, I was even doing, um, uh, I started a company. I was doing, uh, I was making products now using the West Textile. So mm -hmm. what I'll do is I would go to Gikomba Market. This is like an informal market. Buy second-hand clothes, uh, jackets and all. Then make bags out of it. And I was selling this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was in a really noisy matatu. I, I think I'd just come from Gikomba. <laughs> I was sitting right in front of the speaker <laughs> and I get a call and I'm like uh, yeah yeah who is this I can't hear you they're like oh I'm calling you from Bata I'm like oh Bata they're like yeah we would like you to come in on Monday and I'm like okay cool um I'll come so I go I thought I was being called for another interview oh turns out they're actually calling me to hire me yeah this is like six I think it must have been a year or so mm -hmm. after, after I'd interviewed with them Okay. Yeah. Wow. So, okay. So it was a while yes, before they got pretty. back to you. Exactly. It was, I had I, I'd sort of forgotten that I'd even interviewed with them. Mm. Yeah. So when they called me back, I thought it was another interview. Mm -hmm. So it turns out they actually were hiring me. Okay. Yeah. So when they hired me, I was, uh, it was to be a graduate trainee. So the, I was to be trained now to become a future designer. Yeah. And it was so funny because when I was joining the department, it was just now me and my boss. <laughs> yes. The PD manager, mm -hmm. product development manager. Yes. So, wow, I, it was interesting because at that time we were now setting up other product development departments in Africa. So my boss was traveling quite a lot. And it was, I always say I was thrown into the deep end because I joined as a trainee. I didn't have an idea how to design a shoe, but then I had to now start designing shoes that are going to be made in a factory. And you have a team of men who have been in the industry for like 30 years, yeah. you know, they know what they're doing and they come to me. I tell you, every morning, <laughs> it was always like a, a commission of men coming to tell me <laughs> the problems they are facing in the industry that I have to solve. Yeah, so I always say by being thrown into the deep end, I had to learn faster, 
which became an advantage to me mm. yeah, because then I learned very quickly. I also learned how to work with older, you know, you, when you work with older people who have more experience than you, you start to understand, okay, so this is how I should handle myself. Yeah. So even the team I was super supervising within the department because uh, we had sample makers, for example. Yeah. These are guys who knew a lot. So I had to learn how to listen to them. So you don't, uh, you don't assume you know everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So over time, you learn that as much as you are supervising someone, you're also collaborating with them, basically, mm. yeah. Because if they don't do it right, you will both fail. Yeah. Sure. yeah. So then, I, that's how I grew. Um, I remember <laughs> uh, we had uh, the regional, uh, you know the way companies, uh, multinational companies uh, group their countries? Mm -hmm. uh, so there'll be, the, of course, the developed markets, emerging markets, you know, like that. So for mm -hmm. us, Kenya fell under the emerging markets. And our regional head was based in South Africa. And he used to say, do not, in, in, uh, do not innovate, copy. And I'd always argue with him. And everyone was afraid of him. So in meetings, you know the way you're in a meeting and you're supposed to keep quiet because the boss is speaking. He would say something like, do not innovate, copy. And I'd be like, no, we are designers. Our job is to design. <laughs> and he, so I... In fact, I think people used to tell me, Esther, you'll get fired. You need to stop speaking to, you need to stop arguing with the mm. boss, you know, because it's the boss of my boss of my boss, honestly, you know. I, I, I kept on telling him, uh, no, uh, I'm, a, I'm a designer. My job is to create. I cannot just copy. Yeah. So we would have this back and forth a lot. And everyone used to tell me, Esther, you'll get fired one day. Stop arguing with the boss, the big, big boss. Uh, but it paid out because one day I'm called to the, uh, the managing director's office. And he tells me, I've gotten an email from the regional manager, and he wants you to run this project. And uh, the idea was to repurpose or rebrand Pata Pata. So we wanted to create a new look for Pata Pata, and we were going to work with uh, communities based in Kenya mm. to develop a collection. And I was like, what? That is so cool. Mm. Wow. Yeah, so they put me in charge of... Uh, of uh, scouting for groups so we found groups like kazuri uh, those uh, namayana this is a women's group uh, like kazuri is a, a fair trade group where single mothers uh, are hired and basically they make uh, beads, beads out of yeah. fired clay yes mm. the namayana was a group of women uh, maasai women who actually would have beaded our product while herding goats and sitting under a tree can you imagine yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So I was uh, I, I scouted quite a number of uh, at, um, uh, how can I say like groups in Kenya that we could work with because mm -hmm. it was a sustainability kind of project. Yeah. And then uh, we came up with a completely new uh, branding. So imagine you're working in Kenya, yes, but you have teams of uh, designers working in China, working in Europe, working in uh, Kenya, Africa. You know, it was really a fantastic project. And you ended up uh, developing a collection, uh, Pata Pata Ashanti and uh, the bead so we have a strap and the design on the strap is a zebra print you it's not obvious but mm -hmm. when i tell you you're like ah oh, i see it mm -hmm. and then uh, you know the way i don't know uh, i wish i could draw the pata pata there you go. That's what <laughs> ah, the board's for. yeah so you are really uh, so we have the logo so it looks something like this which is basically a pata, a, a shield you, you can imagine a Maasai spear mm -hmm. so that or the shield that they normally hold and then the Pata Pata logo, so it's now like that, mm. like that. So it's we have an all over print that we are putting on the sole of the shoe. Yeah. And this was from the top. So how yes. did the? So from the bottom we look like this. On the top it will be just plain. Uh, so how did the um, the like rubber that. pieces go to hold your toes? Yes. So the strap. Of course, we have the Pata Pata. I hope I'm. Am I even uh, there? Yeah, you can go there. I think. Yeah. The black one might be better. Yes. So, assuming this is your pata pata, flip flop here, mm -hmm. your strap will come here, like that, like that. And uh, if I, I, I just make it wider for you to see, yes. the zebra stripes come here, like that. Uh huh. Yes. <laughs> so, were these released just in Kenya or East Africa or all over? Globally. Africa? Globally. Globally. Yes. So, you have, so, this is another question I wanted to ask you is because bata. You, you said you grew up on Bata. Yes. So did I oh. in Eastern Europe oh, because fantastic. it's a Czech company, exactly, right? So, yes. so it seems like a company that, that established a few markets quite early on. Yes. And then 
really integrated into those markets in some way? Yes. Uh, the way butter works from what I've seen, it, uh, it's, it gives each company autonomy. So that, yes, it's global, but if you ask a Kenyan if butter is a Kenyan company, they'll say yes. yes. Owned by the government. Yes. <laughs> if you go to Czech Republic, exactly. Butter is a Czech company owned by the government. Uh -huh. Nigerians, I was surprised, but even was in Nigeria, you know, West Africa. Everyone thinks the same way. But at the end of the day, it's actually owned by a family, the butter family. Mm. Imagine. Still owned. Yes. <laughs> Still within the family. Still within the family. In fact, I, we recently met the fourth generation who's going to take over from there. Wow. Yeah. So it's not a public business. Imagine, it's not a public business. Wow. Family run company for four generations. And it must be, for the Czech Republic, it must be quite a big big company as well right? very huge in fact we have uh, uh, we have a uh, something called butter fashion weekend that was a project that was yeah. launched globally which is really fantastic and it leads me to talk to one of the other projects that I love about butter uh, when I became a senior manager in 2017 I, I, I was the first woman first Kenyan first black person uh, the youngest to ever held that office before so for me it was very exciting and I remember asking myself so what's, what, what change will I make when I get to this office? You know, I don't want to just get there and then continue doing the same thing everyone else has been doing. Because before, the guys would hold, hold the office, the product development manager in charge of designing. There were always uh, men from Europe, from Asia. Yeah, so I was like, okay, I'm a Kenyan. I know the problems designers face in Kenya. So the first thing I did, I, it's like hit the road running, mm. was to found the Butter Designers Apprentice. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we, ident we worked with the universities, uh, in this case, University of Nairobi and the Technical University of Kenya. They sent us designers who were interested in participating. So we had four mm -hmm. and they, did, uh, they participated in a competition. Yeah. So they were to come up with a product, a shoe for mm -hmm. that we can sell. And in the process, they were going to learn about not just designing, but how as a designer, you incorporate yourself into a multi-level company that is a retail brand and a manufacturing brand. Yeah. So they would, we worked with the um, uh, upcoming guys also in Kenya, people who are in marketing like Brand Bunde, the writer mm -hmm. like Biko Zulu, Nairobi Design Week, you know. So what we do, we, we organize challenges for the designers. So it's not just going to a class and learning. It's um, interactive, yes. So we created content around that. Yeah, so for example, they, uh, we got a fashion blogger, Sharon, and uh, the designers, uh, her favorite shoes were white ngoma. So the designers were to come up with a, a painting challenge where they customize the shoe so mm -hmm. that she'll pick what she likes. And you know, the funny thing is once we did that challenge, it created a trend that is continuing up to now. People are just painting on Goma sure. or whatever, you know, and it's so cool. Every time I see it, I'm like, oh my gosh, this actually created, it's a result of Butter Designers Apprentice. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So it was fantastic. It started in 2017, ended in 2018. We got a uh, winner, Cynthia Lella, mm -hmm. and then uh, this runner up, Ian mm -hmm. Abraham. Mm -hmm. They got Kasha words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, Ian was telling us he bought a camera. <laughs> that ah, that's now, good. Yeah, he's actually Developed doing one. a business on it, uh, with it now. Yeah. So uh, the beautiful thing, and why now I was saying Butter Fashion Weekend, uh, the global company had about Butter Designers Apprentice. They're like, whoa, we love that. And we've been doing Butter Fashion Weekend. So next year, we want you guys to become part of it. And they've only been working with the Italy, mm -hmm. Italy and Czech company. So we were the first African company to be incorporated. Also, the first company out of Europe mm -hmm. to be part of Butter Fashion Weekend. And oh, they have a challenge called Butter Young Designers Challenge. Yeah. So what happened this time around, we worked with uh, six designers, I think six design students from University of Nairobi. Again, went through the process of mentorship, apprenticeship, for them to understand what does it take to, as you're designing, what do you also, uh, what you do to be part of a, uh, an organization that is multinational, I don't know, mm -hmm. a global company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then the two finalists got to travel to Czech Republic. So uh, this time it was uh, uh, Cyprian and uh, a lady, I forget her name. Oh, why do I forget her name? 
old I'm age. I'm sure it will come back to Yes. You. So the two of them got to travel to Czech Republic. They participated in Butter Fashion Weekend. And you know, it's a huge thing. It's like going to New York Fashion Week. Yeah. Yeah. They even had proper celebrities there. Like, whoa. <laughs> and they met the now global, the Butter family. Mm -hmm. They met the CEO of the global wow. company. You know, it was really cool for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was really uh, proud of that moment. You know, the fact that Butter Designers Apprentice graduated into the global Butter Young Designers Challenge. Mm. Yeah, so that was really, those are some of the projects that I really like. And then the other project that I really liked that we worked on was, uh, uh, there's this brand called Edun. Uh, Edun is owned by Bono. Do you know Bono, the rock star? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Edun is owned by Bono and his wife. Edun, how do you spell that? E-D-U-N. E yes. So they approached us and uh, we were to collaborate to develop our collection for Safari at Pata Pata. Yes, and then once we did the collection, guess what? It featured in Vogue magazine and featured in New York Fashion Week. Imagine. Wow. Yeah. So it's, I mean, I always say my, my, my life in Bata was very different from a lot of the other people in Bata because then I, I got to participate in a lot of global mm -hmm. projects with the diverse uh, teammates, you know, like a multidisciplinary kind of teammates. So you're working with the, the CEO of the company, you're working with the managing director, you're also working with your sample makers, and uh, I mean, collaborating with brands and trying to make a change, you know, mm -hmm. in the community. So it was really very fulfilling for me, I think. Mm. Yeah. And I, I guess um, a lot of designers uh, or creatives going into the industry sometimes don't realize that the the career path isn't set yes. so everything that you are learning and in your process mm -hmm. is somehow potentially going to contribute you know yes i was complaining when i was getting my b in chemistry at school mm -hmm. but when my first graduate job was working for a chemical company uh, with design uh, then it suddenly ma made much more sense yes the pieces fall into place exactly yes. who knew that i'd i'd use chemistry because it, you know it's chemistry is also material science yes. it's extremely important to understand these things so. exactly. and every other subject can somehow contribute something to your your career right yeah very true i mean like for shoes for example uh there you're talking about chemistry uh if you're making shoes from injected plastics plastics shrink once they are cold so that is chemistry right there. Mm -hmm. Like I would, we would work a lot with our laboratory because then we would have to, uh, they would have to do, uh, prescribe material that will not over shrink. So imagine I'm making a shoe, a mm -hmm. size four person is supposed to wear it. But once it's uh, injected and it becomes cold, it's yeah. a size two person who can wear it, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, and those are the challenges you would face when you're doing development now for design, you know? Yeah. So you'd have, you, you also come to learn that you, you have to work with a lot of different people from not just designers. Mm -hmm. you you have to work with the marketers you have to work with the sales people it's so funny uh, i think design becomes the most collaborative discipline in the world i think the more collaborative you are as a designer the further you'll grow mm -hmm. yeah i think to me it certainly seems like we get to obviously we we may have our set of skills but we get to work with experts mm -hmm. and show our naivety mm -hmm. and then use their skills to try and solve some of their problems. Exactly, right? exactly. You listen to someone's uh, problem from a different industry and then you create a solution that still suits their industry, mm -hmm. but with the design process in it, with the de you know, with design thinking, basically. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, yeah, and the manufacturing, people don't realize, you know, consumers don't realize that it may take, why it may take two years to develop a pair of flip-flops. Exactly. Or an air freshener, yeah. or, you know? Yeah, like Patapata Pata Pata Shanti, for example, it took us three years. <laughs> By the time we finished that project, we all hated it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone would mention Ashanti and you're like, please keep quiet, please. <laughs> because we had, I think it had gotten to a point where I remember we were supposed to ship out uh, uh, like a pilot uh, shipment. I think it was mm -hmm. supposed to be 20 cartons, each about 10 pairs, so about 200 pairs. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, the rubber we were using for, because the, the rubber compound to use the sole was supposed to be softer and more luxurious, mm -hmm. you know. And it was shrinking there, I'm telling you. You make it a size 10, it shrinks to a size 4. <laughs> wow. Yes. So we are trying to fix this problem and it is not working within the time that we are supposed to. I'm telling you, it, there's a day I remember we were in the office myself, 
my boss at the time was the pd manager and the company manager can you imagine a whole company manager packing flip-flops into cutters that we can ship them out because we have a deadline to reach so it's intense but well you have to do it <laughs> and that's a that's another interesting thing that it, you know work is like sometimes you're just expected to do things that it's a hustle it's entrepreneurship you exactly. know the boss doesn't look down on the job of packing flip-flops exactly. because that's another thing is if those flip-flops don't get packed yeah. the sales don't get made eventually exactly. and this could have a much larger impact exactly. right because i think a lot of the time maybe junior staff don't mm. realize how much impact they're having on yes. an organization yes and i think for me being a senior manager or getting to management taught me a lot about the the how can i say you know when we say ignorance is bliss when you're a junior uh, in a company oh my god you really enjoy a lot of ignorance uh, we would go to board meetings and you're told we have to cost cut this year we have to cost cut 400,000 US dollars mm -hmm. they, and you know they'll not even tell you how to do it they're like figure it out it's your job as a senior manager how do you do it then how yeah. do I save the company uh, 40 million Kenyan shillings in a year you know <laughs> and you, you're not supposed to fire anyone mm -hmm. but you're supposed to make a saving because yeah. the, the easiest thing is fire everyone <laughs> you know so and I started to understand the amount of pressure people go through I always say Every time I observe people in power, look, for example, like Obama. By the time Obama was leaving the White House, he looked like an old man. He had white hair. Look at Obama now. He has swag. He looks like a 30-year-old guy just chilling. Mm -hmm. Why? Mm -hmm. Because there are so many tough decisions to be made every single time. Mm -hmm. So I think any time you, as a designer, you work with someone in, in power, always try to put yourself in their position. I think that taught me... A lot it was the best experience i've ever had because then i've i've worked i think for me working in the same company as a junior you know designer mm -hmm. and then now as a senior manager you start to see both sides and you start to understand ah so this is why this is done yeah and uh, i remember reading somewhere uh the boss knows why but you who's not the boss will will know what you understand mm -hmm. so uh, your boss will come and tell you sweep this place you don't know why, but you'll sweep it. Yeah. The boss knows why, and that's why they're the boss. Yeah. So if you want to get to the point where you're a boss, whether it's you running your own company or you being the boss in a company that is run by someone else, mm -hmm. you have to start understanding why things are done. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. My, I think my first, my first manager always told me as well, always be looking up and down mm -hmm. because <clears throat> the people above you <clears throat> you should really be looking at how to help them fulfill their objectives so that they can look higher and help you and that you can be managing the people below you so that they are aware of why they are doing what they're doing so that they are aware of the importance of their exactly. task. Exactly, right? exactly. Actually, the, f the best, uh, for me, one of the best uh, advice I ever got was make your boss's life easier. Mm -hmm. The moment you make your manager's boss easier, Mm -hmm. I mean, your manager's life exactly. easier. Exactly. That's, That's the one. Yeah. Make your boss's life easier. Yeah. And they'll love you. Forever. Yeah. And the, you, you will get away with a lot of things just because of that. Yeah. <laughs> because actually that's the thing. When, you're, yeah. when you do things that maybe aren't asked of you, yeah. you know, or shouldn't be asked of you, then yeah. you, you really get a step up when, exactly. when you drop the ball. Exactly. It's kind of, yeah. Yeah, because they'll be like, well, I, they've made a mistake, but... This but is they the, try. Yes, they try. This is the person who gets things done. This is the person who sees ahead, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't wait to be told to do something if you can do it without being told. Yes. You know, yeah. It's very, it's, it's, a, it's a thing. I don't know. Maybe, you see, as creatives, we, we suffer from a lack of uh, discipline. Even myself. When, when I look at my younger self and now, I've really developed a sense of discipline mm -hmm. that I did not have. We sleep wherever. <laughs> We, in fact, we, we like saying, ah, I'm not a morning person, you know. But then if you go to, into an industry where people are morning p people, what happens? Do you, want, do you want, let's say, the president of Kenya to meet you at night because you're not a morning person? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because your target should be, if you're a sculptor, for example, you should be saying, okay, I want to make a sculptor, a bust, you know, made out of cast iron of the president of Kenya. Yeah, so you're going to be like, okay, so I'll be meeting him at midnight because I'm not a morning person. Never, you know. Yeah, if you're if you're going to 
to run projects. You have to learn project management, for example. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you don't have to go to school to learn project management, but you have to have discipline mm -hmm. to be able to manage a team. Mm -hmm. Imagine managing a team that is not based like uh, in the same location as you are. Mm -hmm. You're managing a team some based in China. Yeah. Time zones are different. Some are based in Europe. Time zones are different. Yeah. You're managing <laughs> a team where some people are at a lower level than you. Some people are at a much higher level than you. So how then do you deal with this? It's discipline, basically. Yeah, so creatives, at some point, we do lack this. Mm. So it holds us back. Mm. So I think uh, we, we can't use it as an excuse anymore. Yeah, well you sort of have to realize, and I always used to tell my boss this, and then he would laugh. Every time I would go and negotiate my salary, I would tell him, you know, I'm a business. Yeah. <laughs> the way butter is a business, I am a business. And yeah. currently, I'm working at a loss. And he would laugh and he's like, okay. It's a professional exactly. transaction. Yeah. So you have to think of yourself, even though mm -hmm. you're an individual, as a business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a business could be doing something purely based on CSR. Mm -hmm. Then that's okay. Volunteer, mentorship. Like for me, I really, I think my, my one major thing was I want to mentor as much as I can. Mm -hmm. Give back. Because I feel I've gotten to the level where I am as a designer purely because of the people who mentored me. Yes. Yes. Like the lecturer who signed me up for Terra Nova. She changed my life. Yeah? Shout out to who? Yes. Francisca Udundo, University of Nairobi. Oh, Francisca. Yes. yes you've okay. met her. Uh, of course. Yes. 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 She changed my life, honestly, because without that, I met, never have loved design as much as I love design now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Professor Dodge Pido, he was my supervisor for my master's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and actually, okay. Also my undergrad, actually, yes. He's a product designer, but um, uh, we were doing textile design. We were only three in the class, mm. and we did not have a supervisor <laughs> because there were no textile designers. Wow. And we, we had a group, we had a meeting as the three of us, and we were like, okay, we think Odoch could teach us because he's a very, he has interests in a lot of mm. design. He's not those, uh, He's not uh, narrow-minded. He's very broad-visioned. Yes. yes. And he actually taught me that. Be broad. Don't just narrow your mind to one thing. And we went to the school, the director of the school, and we convinced her to, to get a Dutch to be our supervisor. And he changed my life, honestly. He, he, his way of thinking, he talk to any designer in Kenya, they will tell you he's touched their life mm. positively in one way or another. Mm -hmm. yeah. So currently he's the director of school at uh, Technical University of Kenya, mm -hmm. yeah, School of Design. Yeah. Then uh, there's uh, Dr. Suki, Suki Mwendo. Yeah. For her, I think what I took away from Suki was excellence. She does not, she does not want things that are not excellent. And I know perfection is not good, but sometimes aiming for perfection makes makes you land at 80% or 90%, you get, mm -hmm. as opposed to being like, yeah, whatever. And mm -hmm. you know, creatives how we are. You're like, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm in the mood for, you know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so she got me out of that mentality of whatever. When you do something, do it to the best of your ability. Absolutely. Yeah. And if you look at the designers who are celebrated globally, look at Ivy, um, what's his name? Uh, the designer for Johnny Ive. Johnny Ive, yeah. yeah. He, I mean, obsessive. I'm obsessive. Mm. Yeah, I, 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 honestly wish I could be that obsessive because I, 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 I'm not. It's not mm -hmm. in my in my nature. Mm -hmm. But wow, look at how just the curve. I mean, we are seated in front of an Apple mm -hmm. product. Mm -hmm. This, mm -hmm. he, he, oh my God. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It's, in, it's um work of uh, art as much as it's a, it's a design product. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing how obsessively. Uh, he went obsessively after perfection, mm -hmm. basically. It was never about, eh, this can do, let's move on. Mm -hmm. It was, no, it has to work, and it has to work right. Mm -hmm. Then we put it into the market, mm -hmm. yes. And I think the other thing that um, I noticed, you see, in Kenya, in school, I'm trained to be a product designer. Unfortunately, product design is sort of dying. Mm -hmm. We are moving into industrial design, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure for you, you saw it when you were in Europe, yeah? You, sure. you actually train more as an industrial designer than yeah. a product designer. We had, so my university had a BSc, mm -hmm. which was called Product Design and Technology, and a BA, which was called Industrial Design and Technology. Wow. So the BSc was more focused around engineering, electronics, and mechanics. 
um, their technical skills. Yes. And then our degree was more focused around the human studies, understanding of emotion. Mm -hmm. In fact, my thesis was around design for emotion. Oh. So it was very much kind of human centered. That's, yeah. that's where I kind of choose to, chose to go. Yeah. But um, when I started university, Johnny Ive was the guy, yeah. right? It was, the, he was the one that I think most upcoming or aspiring product designers wanted wanted to be yes. um, and I think what is really important is to remember that these things that look so simple to us from the outside the more simple something is the more complicated it was to execute exactly because the original computer had cables and a mouse with a you know everything yes. was connected and it had a separate tower yes. and now we're just down to a single screen yeah. that that Good design is about what you take away yes. rather than what you add sometimes, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. I don't know which designer it is, but uh, they say, I think it was Marilyn Monroe, it wasn't even a designer. She used to say, if you look at yourself after you've dressed up and you're going out, for example, and you think, oh, something is wrong, mm -hmm. start by removing the last thing you put on yourself. So if it was makeup, remove the makeup. If it was earrings, remove the earrings, you know? Yeah. Simplicity. Actually, yeah. simplicity is genius. Actually, mm. genius is simplicity. Yes. A lot of people think uh, uh, someone like, uh, what's his name? Leonardo da Vinci. A lot of people think he's a genius. Mm -hmm. And I used to think he's a genius. And at some point, I got obsessed with him. I used to be like, wow, this guy uh, is very inspirational to me, you know? And I would read up about him and I'd be like, what? This guy's not a genius. He's just curious, you know? Yeah, like he had the habit of doing something over and over and over until mm -hmm. it was now working. You know? yeah. And he also had vast interests, you know. So he, he actually invented, uh, people say he was the inventor of surgery as we know it now. Although maybe there's a group of African women who we found invented, uh, it's called what? Caesarean mm, section. Caesarean. Yes, before Julius Caesar, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but he turns out he was... His interests were not just in art. Mm. Yes, it was in science, it was in uh, medicine, it was in military, like uh, mm -hmm. he invented the gun. Helicopters, tanks, yes, and all, all those sorts. things. Yeah, you know. And what, how did he learn? He didn't <coughs> go to school to learn it. He actually did a lot of observation. Mm -hmm. There was a diary that was found uh, uh, for Leonardo da Vinci, and it was so funny to me because, uh, you know, they are writing a to do list. One of them was. Um, to go sit with Gali Galileo, mm -hmm. yes, <laughs> to attend Galileo's lecture wow. and have a sit down with him. I was like, <laughs> what? Oh, wow. Yeah. So it, he, <laughs> for him, it was those things of like, if Jesus, I think if Jesus was there during his time, mm -hmm. would have been to go meet Jesus and discuss, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, about religion or mm -hmm. something like that. So as a designer, apart from being able to create simple products, you have to start being curious. You really have to be a curious person. And we live in a world that is becoming so intertwined, you mm. know? You can no longer say, I'm just a designer. Yeah? Like for me, I always tell people, I started as a textile. I, I mean, that's what I, my training did, textile mm -hmm. and fashion design. But I've ended up practicing as a product designer more than a fashion designer, actually. Yeah, and I've actually also become a lecturer. I've almost, I mean, I've been a manager now, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, I've been able to do even project management because of all the projects, you know. So it's, it, it becomes very fluid over time. Yeah. We can no longer be rigid and say, I'm a graphic designer or yeah. I'm a textile designer or, you know. Mm -hmm. You have to figure out a way to sort of make them flow into each other and be curious. Be, be the person who knows what's happening with Trump, at the same time, what's happening with Brexit? At the same time, what's happening with Apple? Johnny Hive has retired. How does that affect Apple as a company? You know, you still have to be curious about the recession. Currently, there's a global recession, and in Kenya, we can feel the effects of that recession. So, you know, you have to start asking yourself as a designer, how do these things affect me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, look at now the fourth, the fourth industrial revolution, mm -hmm. you know, which for me is of much interest because let me tell you, the one thing I hated when I was in campus was to use a computer. <laughs> so that's changed now. I have to change it. Because I was that person, if you gave me uh, a digital artwork to do, I would do it very quickly by hand. I would be able to just do technical drawings and get you a repeat pattern instead of doing it on computer. And I could give even four different colorways, options, pa, 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 by hand. But now I'm starting to realize I have to change it. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking myself, how do I do it? 
maybe I can avoid using computers by becoming a policy maker. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, maybe become a cabinet secretary or the president. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or I just actually get myself my hands dirty, start working with uh, 3D machines, printing and, you know, doing all this. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. Sit on a computer and learn, uh, you know, Illustrator and uh, 3D works and all those things. Mm-hmm. But it's a choice I have to make. And it's not, we can no longer ignore mm. the fourth industrial revolution. Mm. We can't. If, if even Toyota is looking at autonom- autonomous uh, cars, yeah, self-driving mm-hmm. cars, who are we to not become, you know? Yeah. Yes, we have to be more interested in AI and robotics and how the, you're saying Alexa, how will Alexa affect education in Trukana, for example, mm-hmm. you know? Exactly. Yeah, the way you talked about the 3D printing of Braille, Braille uh, slides. slides. Yeah. I mean, that's fantastic. And uh, I keep saying we, uh, we are constantly behind uh, in Kenya, maybe mm-hmm. in Africa also. We are constantly behind because I feel we wait for trends to happen, then to jump on them. Yeah. I think we need to start be the tre- to start being the trendsetters. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we, there's been talk for the last ten years or so about going to live on Mars. Mm. Is there a designer who's working with the teams that are doing this from Kenya mm-hmm. or from Africa? Mm. Yeah. Mm. So we need to start thinking in that aspect. Mm-hmm. How do I become of value to to Richard Branson's team that mm-hmm. is building a spaceship that will take people, a passenger ship to Mars? Mm-hmm. How do I start working with uh, uh, Elon Musk to to build the, the rockets he's mm. building? You know, like those kind of questions. Even if you're not in the team, but just as pet projects maybe. You mm-hmm. know? Yeah. yeah, I think it's really important to be you know, we live in a world of consumption. You know, that, that's come from consumerism and capitalism. And perhaps it's um, something that we're now looking at. So half the world is aspiring to be mm-hmm. what half the world is potentially starting to realize isn't the right, right way to look at things. Yeah. Um, so now uh, there was a... I think Trevor Noah was saying something about, you know, hippies in America now yeah. were going barefoot, right? <laughs> yes. But when Africans were doing it, it was, yeah, it, it it was, was basic, yeah, right? Yeah, basic. And or poverty. whatever, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think it's really crucial, like you said, for the entire world to be learning from cultures, yeah. from the, the rest of the world. Because, yeah. you know, the way that communities uh live in africa for example in in kenya is really fascinating you know there are so many medicines and from you know chinese medicine african things and Mm -hmm. from all over the world we really just need to kind of get away from this um assumption that everything that's western and plastic is good right yes yes very true so how um so going back to you know your mentorship and your kind of passion for developing young talent how do, what what's your legacy at Bata now besides the you know besides all the designers apprentice and all the projects you've left behind is the team more local now yes i'm so happy by the time i was leaving Bata we had hired uh, <clears throat> i'd basically convinced the boss to hire mm-hmm. uh, we have uh, many designers there two designers actually three designers mm-hmm. three kenyan designers from kenya good yes and one we one uh, apprentice that i was hoping would be developed over time to become not only just a sample maker but in the end to become a designer mm. himself yeah so it was a small team by the time it's so interesting by the time i joined butter it was just me and the boss Mm. By the time I left Bata, I think the team was... Okay, me, the boss, and the sample makers. So mm-hmm. the sample makers were three. Mm-hmm. No, two. Two sample makers, me as the designer, mm-hmm. and the boss. So four people. Mm-hmm. So by the time I've left Bata, the team is three sample makers and uh, four designers. So that's how many people? Seven, eight, and you two. So nine. Plus the boss. Eight, yeah. 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 Eight, nine. Yeah. yeah. So I'm glad. I built uh, a team that uh, I hope... I always used to say when I leave, I hope the person who takes over from me will be a Kenyan, mm-hmm. not someone that has to be brought in from Asia or Europe or whatever. Sure. Yes, I always used to say that. And I always used to tell my team, work towards sitting on the same seat that I am now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
I I think that's absolutely crucial. I mean, for us, like we always openly say, you know, Nairobi Design Week as well should be run by Kenyans. Yes. And that's the, the long term ambition yeah. for East Africans, at least, you yeah. know. Um, so uh, what else? Um, what else? What other kind of interesting anecdotes might you have? from from your experiences in your career uh i think um do not be afraid uh -huh. yes and it's funny because everyone has fear mm -hmm. so i think uh, that thing of uh, courage is not the absence of fear it's facing the fear that is very true the moment you feel too afraid to do certain things i think is the is the time to push mm -hmm ahead mm -hmm. and overcome them like for me when i have a fear of heights i go skydiving <laughs> you know uh, uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm not sure everyone does that but that's a that's a brave brave thing yeah yeah you know um when i was told i'm going to become this, the product development manager i was like my gosh i'm so young mm -hmm. at that time i was already i had a different plan for the future you know i was so afraid i have to say i was it, that thing freaked me out for so long but then i always say what if i had not done it mm -hmm. i would have had a completely different life now you know yeah so it's not that there's no fear it's just that try learn practice how to overcome your fear mm. so you'll you'll tend you'll realize your life becomes very f much fuller yes mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. and also pushing yourself out of your comfort zone yeah. Okay, so that's not so. Top three tips then for creatives coming into the industry wanting to to make it. Let's say that's number one. Uh, fear, get rid of fear. Get rid of fear. Just go for it. I think uh, in terms of fear, yeah, go for it in the sense that if you want to work, for example, with uh, Osman Masharia, you know, the, he's doing such fantastic work. I mean. I, I've, I've, you know, it's so funny when you meet your legend and then they, they know of you and they're like, oh, wow, you're also doing fantastic. <laughs> and they're like, oh, my God, really? Because <laughs> like yeah. Osborne is working with the Oprah's team, is working with, the, you know, Marvel, mm -hmm. oh, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you want to work with Osborne Mashera, for example, find a way, work with him. Mm -hmm. Whether it means volunteering or, you know, Perfect. begging, stalking him until he says yeah. yes. Just, you know start i think we need to be the generation that starts living life by how, how we feel how we feel and how we want and just go for it mm. be the change makers be the people who we can be written about guys will be like whoa esther could have made a change you know mm. yeah let's be like that let's stop being lukewarm designers you mm -hmm. know? yeah mm -hmm. uh, when you when, when you read about the people who inspire you for example yeah they were never lukewarm they were they were they were all out you know yeah, so I think I'm at that point in my life where I want to be all out, not just timid and lukewarm, you know, following the flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And part of living better for me was that, you know. Sure, sure. Yeah, it was, I've gotten comfortable. Uh, uh, how do I get myself out of this comfort zone? Because now everyone's like, oh, wow, you're the first youngest, whatever. You're the, oh, my God. Oh. So you start getting used to this. Sure. Also, but the, the other thing for designers, maybe this is the second. No, no, this is still under fear. Do not listen to people when they praise you. <laughs> Start, don't internalize praise. Don't internalize criticism because they fuel fear. You'll always be like, I cannot leave butter. What will people say about me? You know, what will, you know, I, 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 butter opens doors for me. If I just say I'm from butter, whoa, mm. suddenly. Yeah? But what if I say I'm Esther and this is what I do? Will mm. that open doors for me? You, you get yeah, so when people praise you too much or they criticize you too much, yeah. it really feeds into your mind and it feeds into your fears and you start caring too much about what people think as opposed to what you feel. Uh, there's, um, there's a force that guides us mm -hmm. towards a certain path, but we are always fighting it. And the biggest fighter of that force is usually fear. Mm. So that's one, fear. Well said. I, I'll add to um, what you said about Osborne because... He, you were there at Nairobi Design Week when yeah. he was talking and he said that, you know, it's a perfect example because he literally said he got into the industry by giving himself side projects, uh -huh. mini projects, mm -hmm. right? And he just created. Yeah. And again, instead of consuming, mm -hmm. consumption is great because we learn and so on, right. but creativity lets you explore your own exactly. things, right? And it yeah. takes you where you don't even realize you would have gone. Yeah. 
So, you know, creating his own projects, look where, look where he's gone now. And it's not to say that the next person who wants to work with him mm -hmm. can't do this, the same thing, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 So that's one. So the second thing I would say is you have to work hard. Uh, we are the generation that has been told over, the, we've been told over and over that we have to work smart. <laughs> and uh, I think that has sort of given us a skewed view of how life works. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in life, you have to work hard. They, you'll never escape it. If you ask Osborne Masharia, he'll tell you that there's that time where he just had to put his head down and work mm -hmm. and just get the work done without excuses, without uh, flaking on people. You know, creatives, we are known for flaking a lot. Uh, I say I'll do this. Uh, if you tell someone, I'm going to give you this project in two weeks, give it in one week. Mm. Under promise, over deliver, mm -hmm. always. And I think that's the other thing for me. I had gotten to a point where I was starting to learn politics. So you overpromise, under deliver, and it's terrible. It, it's even a terrible feeling for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So you need to impress yourself before you impress other people. And mm -hmm. one of the ways you'll do that is under promise, over deliver, every single time. If you say I'll give you in two days, give them in half a day. Yeah. Always be that person. Yeah. Because what happens over time, people in their minds know if anything needs to be done, give it to Esther Kute. Why? She gets it done and quickly. And she'll not lie to you. In fact, she'll do it quicker. You know, always, always, always learn mm -hmm. that. I think it will save you a lot of grief and it will earn you a lot of respect. Mm -hmm. Yes, and respect is important. Trust me. Sometimes respect will get you further than any other thing. Yeah. So is that number three? We've got two. Yes. Have we got a third? Two. Three. <laughs> two. two okay. is... Uh, under promise of a deliver yeah. mainly because then you earn respect and you earn confidence of mm -hmm. people yes which is what you need sure anytime someone is referring you to someone else it's purely yes. because of that yeah. yeah yes so what's the third thing i think the third thing is be true to yourself we 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 want to imitate a lot i mean mm -hmm. we are living in, uh, in, a, in a generation where we are bombarded by people's lifestyles and you know and I see a lot of people struggling with this. And I think this is more from a personal perspective than just professional. So both ways, you know. Uh, do not, uh, for example, uh, want to live in Runda <laughs> because another designer is living in Runda. Mm -hmm. Why? Is that within your means? Mm -hmm. Is that even within your plans? Yeah, maybe you never wanted to live in Runda. So why are you forcing yourself to do this, you know? Just to show people that uh, you're not, I don't know. There's that keeping up with the genesis that is mm. happening right now that is a bit, uh, it's sad. And mm. you've heard of people living with depression, you know, and I think mostly it's because of this. You feel you do not measure. Don't, they say the, the thief of joy is comparison. Mm -hmm. So don't compare yourself to other people. Mm. If Esther Kute is the senior manager in Bata, don't now start wanting to be the senior manager in Bata. I mean, what is your strength? What is true to yourself? Go and do that. Maybe your strength is to travel to India and teach uh, kids in India how to design their, mm. you know, the design process. You do that. And you'll find, since that is your purpose, you'll grow more. When you go to someone else's purpose, you become miserable. Mm -hmm. Then you end up being depressed. Mm -hmm. Start thinking of yourself as a business. Yeah? Because then you also treat... I mean, you see how businesses treat themselves very seriously, yeah? If it's, uh, I, I've never gone to a, a business where people just walk in any time of the day. At here. Okay, I'm checking into work at two. Mm -hmm. No, they, they have a set time for, okay. So if work starts, it's seven, like at Bata, it, it was actually 7.25. Imagine. 25? <laughs> that's, like, that's like school registration, yes. not even 7.30. Yeah, 7.25. Wow. You have to be in the office, that is you late. Yeah. So if a company that has been running for hundreds of years, because Butter Celebration, I think, was it 134? Mm. Yeah. If a company that's been running for that long still has those, you know, processes there, standard procedures, who are you as an individual not to have standard operating procedures? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So start treating yourself as a business. Then you start handling yourself as a business, making money, for example. I think I always say this. I love money. <laughs> I will do things for free. Um, I'll volunteer and all these things. But at the end of the day, I love money. And that, I always say, is one of my end games. And one of the reasons why I love money is because if I have a lot of it, I can make even more change. Honestly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because I have such big dreams for myself. 
and they have such like for example i would like to have a private butter designer's apprentice mm. that i can run for years and years and years you know yeah every year i just get a cohort of student designers and they are able to travel let's say to milan or travel to south africa travel to rwanda and you know learn about design and all and honestly this is things that i would love to do with my time and my mm. life you know my legacies basically you know yeah so uh, money is a good thing let no one lie to you that money is not a good thing but it should not uh, rule your life so what will happen sometimes you'll be forced to make decisions where you will lose money but the bigger picture you will gain more mm. and macrith gave me very good advice a long time ago maybe she doesn't even remember she told me esther if you can learn if you can get a company mm -hmm. to pay you no matter how little but you're learning please use that opportunity and for me at that point it was butter so basically butter has been my mba project yeah. yes I have basically gotten an MBA by being work, by working in butter. Yeah. Fantastic advice. And they always say if you're offered money or experience, take the experience. Money yes. will follow. Exactly. Always. I totally 100% yeah. agree. Yeah. 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 Um mm -hmm. And once you get money, plan your life. Don't be the I think the way we were saying before we started recording, you're buying black label it's every week every weekend. <laughs> Or every night, you know, yeah. enjoyment. We call it now enjoyment. Yeah. I think uh, you have to be level-headed head in such a way that, like for me, I uh, I'm not actively working right now, but I'm able to pay my bills. I'm able to drive my car. I'm able to go have fun. Yeah. Why? Because I had a plan. Yeah. If you're able to get financial advisors, get financial advisors. Sit down, talk to them. They will. Maybe they're very good because they they give you. They get you to list down the things about your life that you want. So mm. it's very clear. Yes. Is it you want a house in Runda or is it a house in Milan or an exactly. apartment in Dubai in the Burj Khalifa, you know, Al Arab, you know? What do you want? And then how do you achieve that? And how in what period of time do you want, you know? Mm -hmm. So usually when you have a stranger looking into your life, they have a clear view because they are unbiased. They don't have any bias towards mm. you. So they give you a very clear vision. If you're able to also get a life coach, because I got one and it helped a lot. The good thing with a life coach, you can cry to them a bit. Like, you go, know, oh, I'm so stressed. Mm -hmm. You know, financial advisors, they'll be like, why are you crying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but a life coach will, will be, like for me, the one I got was even talking about spirituality, you know. So she'll be like, is this aligned to your spirituality? And I'm like, whoa, I've never thought of it that way. Mm. You know? Yeah. So I know we are designers. And I know we are creatives. And most of the time, we are not expected even to be successful. Mm -hmm. But why? Mm. Why can't we be the successful ones? Why can't we have kids grow up and say, I want to be a designer because of Esther Kute, because of Adrian, because of, you know, yeah. Why is it that I want to be a doctor? I want to be an engineer. Sure. Or now a politician because they steal so much. Yeah, you know. <laughs> so we need to get to a point where we are guiding lights. We are actually changing lives. You know, we are, we are the SI unit to success mm -hmm. in Kenya. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that. So, once again, the three points yes. were... Fear. Fear. Do not... Get rid of fear. Yeah, so go through your fear. Because fear is constant. Just go through it. Learn how to power through your fear. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, two. What was two now? <laughs> <laughs> I think we... And, uh, over promise. Yes, no. and, under yes, promise, under promise over, over deliver, deliver, so that you can gain respect. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And you can be considered as a, what is it called? Well, a reliable person. Exactly. Yes. 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 So you gain respect, and you're a very reliable person. That's two. And then three, treat yourself as a business. Mm. Yes. So handle your finances properly. Don't try to be like everyone else because a business like butter, butter sells shoes. Did, have you ever seen butter trying to sell airtime like Safaricom so that they become like Safaricom? Mm -hmm. No, because that's not their business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So focus on your business. Stop leave other people's business out of it. Yeah. Then handle your money. Yeah. In such a way that it's run like a business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you need to invest, invest. Yeah. If you need to leave opportunities so that you can create time for better opportunities in future, then do that. Or you know. But don't find excuses just yeah. because you don't have the materials, exactly. correct? Because the truth Innovate. is... Absolutely. I mean, yeah. you said that you went into 
you know, you get an offer to get paid for something, right? Mm -hmm. And you went to Bata, but mm -hmm. you spent two years doing the Terra Nova project, which yeah. gave you experience for free, yes. which allowed you to get there, exactly. right? Without the free experience from Terra Nova, you wouldn't have gotten the Bata flight. Exactly. Yeah, mm. it was a fantastic experience. Mm. Yeah. So, power through your fear, do not let it hold you back. To under promise, over deliver every time so that you can be respected and uh, consistent in your work. And then three, treat yourself like a business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so that handle your money right. Handle your spirituality right. Let's uh, stop trying to live like everyone else. Yeah. And mind your business basically. So uh, now that you're taking taking a break, yes. have you got any uh, plans for the coming for the coming months and, and time? Uh, to be honest. <laughs> Resting. Now, let me tell you a story <laughs> about how I got my first job. <laughs> um, this is the thing. When we do our final year project in design, it's intensive because you now go work with us, artisans and all this. It usually gets to a point where for us, the women in the class, we would always have stylishly tied turbans on our heads and scarves and all. Mm. And someone would be like, oh, you're such a designer. Mm -mm. It's because my hair looks like a mess. I don't even have time to comb my hair or go to the salon. That is how crazy it would get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So by the time we would finish our project and do the pinup for the exhibition and the exam, we would all tell ourselves, we are going to sleep for a full one month doing nothing. Mm. That's what we would tell ourselves. And I remember even for me, I got a room in campus. I, it was a bit illegal. I convinced someone to <laughs> allow me to stay in their room. So I paid, I think, for three months. Yes, I convinced them. I paid them for three months, so they let me stay in their room. Then uh, I went, I bought snacks, movies, series, all those things. I was like, oof, I'm going to sleep for one month. Guess what happened to me? I went to sleep. I was awake in, like, in, in the middle of the night. I woke up. Now I'm like, I can't even sleep anymore. What is happening to me? And then I was like, oh gosh, I tried. I tried watching. I could not watch a series or a movie. I tried eating the snacks. I couldn't. I couldn't sleep. This is just sleeping for four hours after I was so tired. So I sat. I was like, now what can I do? I was like, let me make a list of the jobs people I would like to work with. So I remember on that list, there was Anne McCreeth, there was Monica Canary, there was Lucy Rao, you know, the people. So I was like, okay. So the next day I was like, okay, I'm going to go to these places and ask them for a job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> So I didn't, I didn't sleep for even a day, not live alone a month. Couldn't sit still. I could not sit still. So yeah. this, with this sabbatical that I've taken, I told myself that I'm going to sleep a proper sleep. Oh my gosh, I have slept. Okay, I have to admit, the first two months were fantastic because for sure I did sleep quite a bit. And then I have a very good friend of mine. She's called, okay, we call her Tight. Tight uh, invited me to stay with her and her family. So she has this small baby. She had just given birth. So it was really therapeutic for me, you know. Because I have, and we are really good friends, and we, it's fun when I'm with her, yeah. So it was a lot of talking, you know, she's on maternity leave. Mm -hmm. It was fun. And then the baby, I, used, I keep saying that uh, Liana was my therapy, like I would just hold her. And then we clicked, like she was born in April, I'm, I'm born in April, yeah, Ari. So it's kind of like we clicked, mm -hmm. yeah. So I would hold her, and she would keep quiet, and everyone else would hold her, and she's crying. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. So it was the first two months were fantastic because of that. That social connection, you know. I think I had sort of lost it because I was always too busy. So this brought back that whole sense of community yeah. for me. Yeah. So I'd say I'll sleep a lot. To be honest, I cannot sleep anymore. I'm sorry. I, I'm a workaholic. I have agreed and I've come to accept myself <laughs> as I am. Uh, so I would say maybe I'm definitely interested in doing my PhD. Yeah. In mm -hmm. fact... Uh, so that's, I'm looking at uh, applications and all those kind of things. Um, there Can some you tell us about your interest areas? Uh, um, definitely the fourth industrial revolution. Uh -huh. yeah. I'm really like, how do I as a designer fit into this whole picture? Yeah. So uh, 3D printing, although it's already here with us, how do we make it mainstream as opposed to uh, uh, currently the way it's a bit more experimental you mm -hmm. know and how do we apply it to kenya you know mm -hmm. or africa for example yeah i'm um, interested in how every time someone says someone is going to mars i'm like what i read somewhere that puma <laughs> puma was designing uh, suits for people who will be living in mars i'm like why did i think of that crossover exactly i was like why for sure you need certain kinds of clothes different from what is on earth if you're going to live on mars you know yeah, so um, I'm, I'm at that point where I want 
to figure out my place in this whole fourth industrial revolution mm -hmm. and not for now for the future you know mm -hmm. yes like in the next five or ten years or even 20 years mm -hmm. like how will Esther Kute have featured there not you know so that would probably be my PhD research uh, thesis and the other thing while I was a butter we used to get a lot of requests for uh, customized shoes for guys with uh, deformities or mm -hmm. you know um, yeah, able differently and we, all, we used to struggle to, you know, to supply. To provide, yeah. Yes, to provide, you know, because the demand was higher than the supply. And also in terms of equipment, we never quite, that was not our area of uh, concentration. So mm. the equipment was never there, you know. And I've really been thinking, how then do I fill that gap? Because I have the expertise, I have the experience, I just need to do it. Yeah. So it's like a question I've been saying. I've been telling myself this is something I need to do. Mm -hmm. I just need to do it. Just do it, basically. Yeah. So let's many see. things, many uh, ideas. It's um, it's it's basically just streamlining things into uh, uh, how can I say maybe three or four bullet points mm -hmm. or things I want to do because I mean it's you, as a person you can't say you're doing just one thing. And then you're like, I cannot do the rest. Mm -hmm. ah, that's been crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you can do at least maybe three, four things. Do one thing well instead of doing 10 things exactly. halfway or not even halfway, exactly. right? Exactly. So. so those are the areas of concentration. Of course, teaching. I love teaching. I swear mm. to God. Oh, I miss teaching. I think oh, if anything, I've always said I want to retire when I'm 40 mm -hmm. from active employment so that I'm able to control the things I work on. But I think I want to retire. I, I always say I'll die. I'll just drop dead in class when I, for teaching. Honestly, I love it. I'll just be like, I'm eight years old with my stick <laughs> in the class. Like, so design thinking. <laughs> I'm sure your lecturers will be happy to hear that. I think they've definitely had a, an impact on, on uh, you. For sure, yeah. I, I, and I never thought I would love teaching that much. Mm. I think it was those things where I would be like, oh, I, I don't even think I'll be that good. But then mm -hmm. it was really fantastic when I did it because I was teaching at the Technical University of Kenya. Yeah, I was lecturing design courses. Yeah, so it, I really, really enjoyed it. And it was to see that I'm making a change. I think that was maybe the thing for me. Like, you actually see change. You see a student joining the class. And a lot of students, the good thing is over time, they became more interested in having design. Like for me, uh, in the beginning, I wanted to be an architect. Mm. Yeah, So it took time for me to, enjoy, to, to love design. It's good to see that a lot of people now want to be a designer. <clears throat> so they've not been forced into design. Mm -hmm. Yes, but then there's a, a lack of clarity about what design is, especially here in Kenya. It's confusing. It's still not sure. Even I'm sure if you ask a random stranger, uh, <laughs> if you ask a random stranger in the street, what is design? They'll probably not be able to tell you what design is. Fashion, furniture, yeah. maybe. Maybe, yes. Right. In fact, a lot of people, when you ask them what design is, they think, oh, draw. Mm. So it's always sad when I go for meetings with the cabinet secretaries and all these roundtable meetings, and then they, they're like, you're like, I'm a designer. And they're like, oh, can you draw me? Hey, please. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's not what we do. So to, for me to see students, in the beginning, not even understanding what design is. And by the end of the semester, this is three months, mm. they, they are so clear on what design is. And mm -hmm. they're so clear on who inspires them and this kind of things. And they're so clear on their future path. Ah, it's amazing to me. And the, that passion they have. So it's no longer oh, just design. You know, It's now a passion. Mm. Yeah. For me, that was fantastic. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Oh, it's been you. an absolute pleasure. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that you would like to tell or ask our community? Maybe you have a question for everyone. I think I would just say, what is your passion? Always ask yourself that. What's your passion? Like, why are you doing what you're doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that question, there, it's a very cliche question, but they always say, what would you do if you had suddenly a lot of money? Mm -hmm. Would you still continue doing what you're doing? If you didn't have to work. Exactly. Yeah. If you didn't have to work. If you, your, your rent was paid, you have everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if then, you, if you had money, you'd stop doing what you're doing. Why are you doing it then? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is not just for designers. It's for everyone. We, in Kenya, we are living a life where people are doing things because they have to as opposed to they want to. So, mm -hmm. yeah.
let's do things because we want to. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, well, you are on sabbatical, so uh, we don't want to encourage too many people to cram your inbox. But if people do want to find you, see what you're up to, where yeah. can they find you? Oh, wow. I've been trying to get off social media. <laughs> good, good. That's not a bad thing. Yeah, but, uh, well, <laughs> I mean, just search Esther Kute. Because mm -hmm. the good thing is currently most of my social media is Esther Kute. Yeah. Yes. Send me an inbox in whichever you find, whether it's Twitter, whether it's... Uh, LinkedIn, although I'm not so much on LinkedIn, where else? I guess, yeah, those are the two you can... So Twitter, Twitter, yeah, Twitter, Twitter would be the best, yeah. Oh, yeah Esther yeah. Kute on Twitter, mm -hmm. yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Ah, thank you so much, Adrian. Be sure to visit NairobiDesignWeek.com and subscribe to our channel for more African design. And leave a review or comment to let us know what you thought. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank mm -hmm. you.